About 2.1 million years ago, human ancestors migrated from Africa to Europe and Asia. But to do that, they would have had to journey through northeastern Africa and Middle East, which means traversing through vast scorching desert with barely any food, water or shade to rest. For a long time, researchers have speculated on how Homo erectus, often known as the first humans, could have crossed the dry and merciless Sahara Desert. Now, researchers from Aarhus University suggest that Homo erectus may not have walked through the desert when they left Africa. They possibly chanced onto an occurrence that happens once every tens of thousands of years, a time when Sahara was green. In this episode, I tell you all about the Green Sahara or the African humid periods and how that may have helped humans take over the globe. I am Mohana Basu and this is Pure Science. About 6 million years ago, in the deep forests of eastern Africa, our earliest ancestors began to evolve in a direction, while evolution of chimpanzees, our closest relatives in the animal kingdom, took a different turn. Over the next millions of years, the differences between early humans and chimpanzees became greater and greater. Our ancestors climbed down from the trees, began to walk upright on two legs and thus freed our hands to handle tools. This was the beginning of development that ended with humans conquering most of the globe. And then, somewhere about 2.1 million years ago, Homo erectus migrated from Africa. Now, for a long time, scientists have known that there are recurring periods when the climate in Sahara changes. This is known as the Green Sahara or African humid periods. During a green period, the desert shrinks significantly and is transformed into a landscape that resembles the savannas we know from Eastern Africa today. Now, research from the Aarhus University team shows that the Sahara, precisely in the period when the first Homo erectus migrated, was greener than at any other time in the 4.5 million year period that they studied. So that probably means that human ancestors most likely walked through a green corridor out of Africa. The Sahara as we know it today is in one of its dry periods. The duration of such a period varies but approximately every 20,000 years the continent has gone through a full cycle with both a rainy and a dry interval. How wet the humid green periods became varies. There are indeed two other cycles that also come into play. One lasts 100,000 years and the other 400,000 years. We'll talk more about this later in this episode. But the question is, how did the team know what the climate was like in Africa several hundred thousand years ago? The team found the answer in layers of the seafloor. According to the team, using core samples from the Mediterranean, uh, one can see what the climate was like millions of years back in time. Layers of sediment are formed on the seafloor and small molecules in these layers act like time capsules, telling us quite a bit about what the climate was like in the past. Over time, new layers are formed on the seabed with material that blows from the northern Africa out over the sea where it slowly descends. The buried seabed does acts as a kind of a logbook that can tell us what the climate has been like back in time. In the layers, there are a suite of biomarkers that store information about the climate of the past. One of these markers is a series of molecules that plants use to protect their leaves. They are also called leaf wax. Wax gives leaves on trees, bushes and grasses the coating that makes them shine. When plants die, most plant parts decompose quite quickly, while the wax molecules can survive for a very long time. That's why we often find such molecules in sediments that are millions of years old. The chemical composition in these wax molecules can tell something about what the climate was like when the layer was formed. The key is to trace the hydrogen molecules in the wax because that can tell you how much precipitation there was at the time. 
The water on earth contains both regular hydrogen and heavy hydrogen known as deuterium. When it rains a lot, the plants are able to absorb relatively less heavy hydrogen while when it is dry, they absorb more. The black dot in the Mediterranean Sea in this map shows where the sediment core was collected. This site receives terrestrial material from northeastern Africa, which was affected by the African humid periods that changed the landscape and the vegetation. From the amount of heavy hydrogen in the leaf bags, we can learn a lot about when it rained and when it was dry. However, hydrogen does not tell anything about which plants thrived in the wet climate. For that, scientists turn to carbon. In the plant kingdom, there are, broadly speaking, three different ways to perform photosynthesis and what kinds of carbon isotopes are in the plant wax is determined by this. There are C3 and C4 plants and the third variant called uh, the CAM plants. 90% of all plants are C3 plants. 6% are CAM plants and only between 3 and 4% are C4 plants. However, not in Africa where the large grasslands have a much larger proportion of C4 plants. The difference between the plants is due to the different coping strategies when moisture in the air and soil are limited. When it gets too dry, C3 plants close the small stomata in the leaves which they use to absorb CO2. With the holes closed, the plant cannot perform photosynthesis and begins to burn through the carbon reserves while exhaling water and CO2. If this continues for too long, the plant dies. C4 plants, on the other hand, are able to perform photosynthesis even when it is dry. Despite their stomata being closed, they continue to convert CO2 into energy. They can do this with the help of the molecule with four carbon atoms of which the plant type is named. Uh, CAM plants use the third method and can cope in even drier areas. Wheat, oats, rice and sunflower are some examples of C3 plants. Known C4 plants include maize, sugarcane and amaranth while succulents, cacti and pineapple are some CAM plants. At the time of Homo erectus migration from Africa, the team found more C3 in the samples than any other humid period in the last 4.5 million years. This shows that the wetter climate changed parts of the area from desert to grassland and savanna. The green periods in Africa occur like the ice ages in northern latitudes due to small variations in the Earth's orbit around the sun. Geologists call these variations the Milankovic cycles and it is particularly two of these variations that play an important role when the Sahara gets more precipitation. The earth wobbles a little bit in its orbit around the sun. This wobble creates climate fluctuations every 21,000 years and that causes the African humid period. The other cause of these fluctuations is how circular the earth's orbit around the sun is. During some periods, the orbit is more elliptical and during others, it is more round. This causes fluctuations with about 100,000 and 400,000 years in between. The Sahara was at its greenest about 2.1 million years ago. Here, several of the cycles are most likely to have coincided to create such an environment. This coincides with when Homo erectus migrated. The climate has therefore most likely facilitated this migration. Learning about human evolution helps us understand our origins and the processes that led to the development of modern humans. It provides a context for who we are, where we came from and how we are connected to other species. Studying the relationship between human evolution and climate also helps us understand how early humans adapted to diverse climates from the savannas of Africa to the Ice Age environments. This knowledge is relevant as we face contemporary environmental challenges and climate change. Climate has played a significant role in shaping human migration patterns. Changes in climate such as shifts in temperature and sea levels have influenced the movement of human populations. Understanding past migrations can provide insights into the current and future patterns, especially in the context of climate-induced migrations. Once again, this is Mohana Basu, Senior Assistant Editor at The Print. If you like our work, do consider paying for a subscription to The Print. You can do so through the link in the description box below.